fab. <laughs> so we're delighted to have Ali, the fungi guy, here with us this evening. Um, it's the perfect time of year to learn about the fascinating kingdom of fungi. And there's been such a phenomenal interest in this event. Um, so thank you so much for coming. Um, Ali is a fungi expert and he leads inspiring events and forays across the country, um, also devising activities for UK Fungus Day, which was last week. And I can also vouch um, for Ali as I attended one of his fantastic fungi workshops a few weeks ago and it was captivating. Um, so he's here to take us on a whirlwind tour of all things fungi. Um, so enjoy and I'll hand you over to Ali now. Well, you who good evening, everybody. Um, I'm just going to change my screen setting if I may. Let's have a look. I'll just change my view and then it works for me. There we go. That, that's kind of it. Uh, hi. Hey, listen, I'm really flattered because it seems like there's quite a big turnout. Uh, oh, I say I'm flattered. It's all about the fungi. You might have no interest at all in me. It's just that you're really buzzing about fungi. So let's hope I can do that some justice. A couple of housekeeping from me. I apologise if we have any City fans, because my sons are United fans. I don't even have a spare room. This, this is real life here. I was supposed to have time to dress this room beautifully, and all I managed to do was quickly whip off these flyer Garrick bunting and stick it over a blanket. So I apologise that we haven't got the glamour. But this is real life, isn't it? And this is definitely, you know, a real life working dad, husband, and bad one of those at, at this time of year, because everything I do is filled with fungi. Um, so I hope you enjoy what I'm going to share with you this evening. It's a proper whistle-stop tour. I have got so much to share that I'll just try and nibble away at a few different things, which um, are hopefully are insight and some new things for some of you at least. I don't know, obviously, where everyone is up to in their journey with fungi or learning about it, but you're here, and let's hopefully I can share something that's new to you or that's of interest. Um, so let me share my screen. I'll try and, What I'm going to try and do is bob in and out of it. So that it's not just me talking and not just pictures, a bit of everything. So let's go for that one. Uh, and then I need to be able to, ah, now I need to be able to see. Uh, I can't, I can't make, excuse me a moment, because I can't make my screen big because the bar's in the way. Uh, so I need to just move that out of the way. There it is, there it is. Slideshow. Excuse me one moment from beginning. There it is. Okay. We're talking. We're up and running. Okay. Oh, I gave it a different name. I preferred yours a wild night in. So yeah, a, a, a visual fungal buffet. Okay. Yeah, we're not, this is not an eating thing with fungi. So let's have a little look. Um, hoping it will move on. There we go. Who am I? So yeah, well, I've had an introduction. I won't, I won't bore you for too long, but I've been a member of the British Mycological Society. I work closely with them for or, uh, organizing events for UK Fungus Day. And that's part of their education and outreach committee, um, which is largely trying to get the youth involved, but actually anybody. But youth is kind, I'm not, I'm gonna say specialism, but I work in a primary school. That's my full-time job. Uh, I'm a behavior mentor for children in a primary school, which I love that, that job. And as a side note, uh, I try and get fungi involved in any way possible uh, as part of that, because then everybody's happy, the kids and the teacher. Um, I'm also a member of the Northwest Fungus Group. I'm on their Education and Outreach Committee too. So there's lots of overlap. I'm basically just bouncing around the country at this time of year, trying to put on events and do things that, because I really care about talking about fungi and that hopefully you'll, you'll get a taste of that this evening. It actually, my journey um, started with, with you guys because although I've been in fungi a little while, I was approached to do a, a magazine article and I did at the time I didn't have um, Instagram. And so I was asked to then do an Instagram takeover and it's just a balloon. It's, I tell you what it's done. It's mushroomed. Thank you. That's as good as it gets, but it's mushroomed and I've got this quite a handsome following and it's a really lovely space. I enjoy being in uh, Instagram, sharing fungal things with people who are into nature. And I think I'm like their fungal person to go to a uh, one of, I'm sure. Uh, okay. So yeah. And there's a little bit about, um, there's my Instagram, uh, which is the fungi guy. I think I might mention that later on. Okay, tonight's menu. What's on the uh, What's on the menu? I'm going to do a few things. There's that's a big list, that isn't it? But like I said, I'm going to try and come in and out to make it as engaging as possible because I'm aware that we're all sat down. You're either hungry or you've had your tea and you're full from it. But I just hope that this hour can be engaging for you. 
So I'm going to make it as good as I can. So it's what are fungi? What do fungi do? Well, what's a mushroom then? Meet my mates. That's fungal mates. So you want to find fungi? The weird and the wonderful three top tips for finding fungi. How a mushroom gets its spots. And then we'll have, I, didn't, I don't know if I have room for a little bar. Q&A at the end. There's time have some questions. I'll make sure there's some space at the end for that. Uh, okay, listen, uh, I want to start with the game because I think that's fun. I'll be honest. So um, I can't see everyone. I'm going to put you on your big big view now. I want to be able to see some faces here. Uh, so uh, I, if, if you are the same, it's quite nice to see the big grid as well. True or false, uh, there are lots of amazing names in fungi. So things like King Alfred's Cakes, the Clubfoot, um, and, and, and beyond. The Hairy, no, I won't tell you anymore in case it's in here. So what I've done is I've made a few names up. So some of the names on screen might be true, and you'll give me a thumbs up. If you think the name is false and I've made it up, thumbs down. Can you beat the teacher? Keep score. All right, we'll go for the first one. First one is Merlin Stink Shield. Thumbs up or thumbs down? Okay. Oh, this is good. I've only got a small amount of windows in view and everyone's got the thumbs up. The answer is false. Sorry, that's uh, that's one to me. <laughs> but oh, Unless you beat me, of course. All right, next one. The Mouse P. Pink Gill. What do we think about that? The mouse pee pink gill. I'm getting, I'm getting both now. Mixed reactions up and down, and the answer is true. Well done if you got that right. Yeah, I can see hands aloft. Okay, we're having a great time, aren't we, this Thursday? And it's a real fungus. There it is. It's actually one I've never found, but I tell you, if I do find it, you'll find me kneeling down smelling it because it supposedly smells of mouse wee. Not sure I know what it smells of, but we'll, uh, you know, I'll address that when I see that mushroom in the right environment. Next one. The octopus stink horn. What do you think about that one? Surely not. Oh, oh, I can see quite a few thumbs here. Thumbs up. I can see. All right. Yeah, we've got some people with a little bit of fungi knowledge already. There it is. The incredible octopus stink horn that comes out, also known as devil's fingers. Another one on my bucket list. Um, quite transient. Not so common in this country. Um, yeah, really would love to see and smell that fungus. All right, the Snake Tongue Truffle Club. How do you feel about that one? I can see all thumbs down in my little windows. Oh, we've got a, a, a partnership there against each other. They're playing against each other. The answer is true. Yes. <laughs> I can see genuine joy there, Mr. McCaster. It's very good. You're the person in my window right now, and he's delighted. Yes, it's true. Uh, an amazing fungus. This is a parasite and it parasitizes uh, truffles. Now, not the typical truffles, the edible ones, like summer truffles that we're familiar with, that we might see in cooking show and stuff. We actually have a lot of species, uh, dozens in this country. And this one, uh, if you dig through, you can dig down and find it attached. It's mycelial strands attached to the truffle underground. And I've found that one, it's a beauty. Little, little brown matchsticks they are. Lovely stuff. The squatter's nut cushion. Would I, um, must be made up, must be made up. It is made up, it's one of mine, <laughs> it's one of mine, okay. That was for my own pleasure there. Let's have a look, plums and custard. Yeah, that's real, it's real. Oh, there we go, that person thinks it's real. Whoever they, they're shouting from the back of the kitchen for Definitely the conservatory. Real. <laughs> Someone's got the microphone on and they're shouting from the conservatory. It is real, it's true. That passionate lady was correct. Plums and custard. Uh, So-called because of the way it looks. I don't think it's an edible mushroom and certainly doesn't taste of it. If it is, it's because that beautiful two-tone of kind of you know, purple and yellow. All right, nearly, nearly there now. Ladies' frilly nightgown. You're not so sure now, are you? I've got you, I've got you on the ropes. And the answer is false. Yeah, it's one of mine. It's false. It's not true, that one. Um, okay, moving on. The horsehair parachute. How do you feel about that? Okay, good. We've still got the mixed mixed ones. Let's have a look then. It is true. And there it is, this beautiful, uh, what the, the parachutes, Merasmius is the Latin name for those. A beautiful genus with these very wiry, dark, wiry stipes. They're only very, very slight, very small things. Well, some of the decayers, there are saprotrophs, the recyclers. Look, I'm slipping some learning in there. I didn't intend to do that. It's just a game. Uh, okay, nearly finished. The Devil's Butter Nubs. True or false? Another division in the McMaster household there. Another division. We've got an up and a down. And the answer is 
Oh, no. No. Of course not. That's one of mine. Okay. And to finish, how about that? Dare it. Dare it be true. Harry Nuts Disco. Are you ready for the final? Has anyone got a clean sweep? It's true. Yes. All right. Did anyone get a queen, clean sweep? Maybe that's the best lady of the evening, if anyone actually managed to get the whole lot. Um, and this is it. It's an incredible fungus. Um, and I was, I've was i been teaching about this for years because it's got a funny name. The disco is, is disco mycete. It's short for that's the type of fungus that it is. Uh, the hairy nut is the, is the fact that this substrate, the habitat for this fungus is the inner, soft inner hairy surface of a sweet chestnut shell. But it has to be last year's. Never found it. Did this little game the other week at a workshop. And then we were having lunch and a gentleman came up. He said, is this that thing? And it was there. And I was absolutely delighted to finally meet in person the Hairy Nuts Disco. All right. Uh, let's have a look. What are fungi? Uh, a whistle stop tour on what they are and their importance. Um, they are neither plant nor animal. Um, we're actually closely, more closely related to fungi than fungi are to plants because they can't create their own food. They need um, water and very similar traits as, as such as those. So they are neither plant or animal. In fact, they are a kingdom of their own. Um, what's interesting to me, I might have, I've got my picture at the end here. Hill, here it is, look, a very significant year, 1969. I'm just gonna change my, uh, thumbnail. there we go, that's better. Just don't need so many people. Uh, 1969, a significant year when they put man on the moon, and when scientists realized that fungi are not a plant and deserve to be a king of their own. So that huge momentous occasion, yeah, the moon's pretty good, but yes to fungi being a kingdom all of their own. Uh, so remember that, 1969, important year. Um, just mentioned that one. Um, out of sight's the important part. There'll be, so the fungus itself, let's just mention that. So they, they're out of sight in the sense that they are all around us all of the time. They are the spores are in the air that we breathe. They're in us, they're on us. They're a part of our, they shape our landscapes. They, they, we wouldn't have landscapes without fungi. No fungi, no forests, no forests, no future. And it's as, it's as simple as that. Um, and obviously they are responsible for maybe 90% of all that's green. Um, huge relationships with almost every plant and tree that there is, which essentially means our food sources also. So without it, there is no life. So they are essential. And the out of sight part is the fact the fungus itself lives on in its substrate. Traditionally, or largely speaking, underground in a mycelial network, a word you may have heard before, mycelium, and it's like cotton wool, essentially to look at cotton wool strands. It's invisible to the eye uh, until it starts to fruit at the surface. So sometimes, especially right now, if you pick up a, a dense pack of leaves, you might see on the underside that mycelium starting to fruit as, as, as a, as a Thing you can physically see and touch and smell but actually it's it's microscopic and they say they estimate the six kilometers of mycelium in a um a cubic inch of soil it's remarkable so it's under every footstep that we take this mycelium lives on what we're seeing and the things i'm going to share with you this evening for instance <laughs> i might as well uh for instance uh do you can you just give me a thumbs up do you see me while i'm talking as well as the sharing the screen a thumbs up if you do. Okay, that's good. Um, you know, a fungus here, this, this mushroom, for instance, is the fruiting body. So the fungus lives on itself all year round for years, dozens of years, potentially hundreds of years. What we see is the fruiting body. So it's a little like the analogy of an apple and an apple tree. This is the reproductive organ designed to drop seeds so they can move on and reproduce and make more. So I'll, I'll mention this, it comes up a little later, but taking a fungus fruit body, uh, taking the, a mushroom from the ground, and I'll talk about why that's important in terms of identification recording, could seem a bit harsh. Like, you know, we all want to tread lightly. I presume there's lots of people who really care about nature here. But we must forget that it's a little bit like taking an apple from a tree. It's no detriment at all to the tree whatsoever. That apple can come. This is very similar to the fruiting body. But that's not to say we shouldn't tread lightly. And of course, it is a food substrate, a, a, a food source for many animals, invertebrates and everything, and all parts of a wider ecosystem. So yeah, treading lightly, but learning where we need to. So that's my kind of standpoint on taking fruit bodies and the point that they're out of sight, the fungus itself lives on, this is just the fruit. All right, what do they do? All right, I'll briefly tell you about this, and then I'll start to get a bit hands-on and try and show you a few bits and pieces. 
um, they have three main roles in nature. All the fruit bodies. Oh, I, I tell you what I've not mentioned in this is, of course, just how important they are in our lives as medicine, foods, as in, you know, um, we won't have chocolate because I think the cacao, I think the, the beans require a fungus to be able to grow. Um, if anyone's having a glass of wine or a beer, that wouldn't be happening without fungi because, of course, of yeasts. Uh, clothing, I'm saying clothing, but actually, well, yeah, cotton. Cotton, cotton bushes wouldn't exist without them because they need a fungus in their in their root system. Um, so yeah, we'd all be naked. That's a, a, a thought for a moment. Uh, I don't know why I brought that up. So yes, we wouldn't exist. The things around us wouldn't exist. So they are all around us. There's even a fungus that lives in the gut of a cow that allows it to be able to produce milk. So without that, cows wouldn't exist. So there's just a fungus for every occasion. So there's all these things that make a big part of our lives. This evening, though, I'm going to talk about the fungi that we can appreciate out and about in this natural environment, the fungal fruit bodies, the mushrooms, the toadstools, the clubs and the corals. OK, so three main roles. If you find one out and about in the woods, in your garden, in a compost, it's doing one of three things. So the first one, let's have a little look. be attached to a certain tree they can only grow with that tree as its host and this mycorrhizal relationship is a, a relationship of symbiosis like all friendships the mushroom gives to be able to grow and thanks the tree it gives the tree phenomenal amounts of water that the root tips alone can't access the tree and it and also many nutrients and in reply in return the tree looks after the mushroom and allows it to grow by giving it sugars because it can't produce its own because it's not a plant so that's the friendship mushroom and we'll look at a couple of those this evening the next uh, uh, role is the recycler, the saprotrophs, the saprobes. If we didn't have these, the world would be choked by now. It would be choking to death on its own detritus, on all, everything, every living thing that, that then dies, that every piece of organic matter needs to be broken down and turned back into soil, essentially. All the nutrients uh, pulled out and, and create healthy soils. They are soil magicians. They are agents of decay. And so there's a habitat for all fungi uh, in terms of substrates, whether it's um, birds' feathers, there's a fungus for sheep's horns. I might mention that later. Um, poo, bones, uh, leaves, twigs, standing dead wood, fallen dead wood. All these things would just sit there forever. And of course, we know it's going rotten. What that means is there's a fungus doing its job, breaking it down. The recyclers, they are essential for our survival. And then you've got the killers. So friend, recycler and the killers, the parasites. And they may be ones to take out old vulnerable trees to allow new growth. Of course, it's all part of a bigger, a bigger picture, greater ecosystem. But they also, there's parasites for insects and people as well. Uh, and I'll share a couple of those in a minute. This is how the, the mycorrhizal one looks. It's essentially, you may have seen pictures of this, um, excuse me, watching various documentaries or the likes. And it's this, they call it the wood web. It's this incredible communication system underground um, where fungi and trees are mycorrhizal. Traditionally, I'll just point this out. Traditionally, I've talked about certain fungi and trees being mycorrhizal relationships. So the beletes, for instance, if anyone's familiar with the ones with the spongy underside, almost every one by one grows. If it's growing in the ground, look up, there has to be the right tree growing with it. It could never just grow in a field. That is a fact. So you'd say, oh, it's a certain type of tree and there are good ones to share. I'll share those with you this evening as well. So you know where to be looking to find fungi. But there are two that are rubbish. Ash and sycamore are dreadful. They have no mycorrhizal associate fungi fruiting bodies. When they've died, there's, the recyclers take over. But in terms of mycorrhizal, so I always thought that they weren't mycorrhizal trees. But actually, there is a mycorrhizal network going on. And to the, it just they don't have fruiting bodies. So I've recently read that to say that if a tree is not mycorrhizal, it's actually a dead tree. So it is going on. They just don't necessarily create fruiting bodies. And a little takeaway tip for this evening, if nothing else, don't go stomping around ash and sycamore woods looking for beautiful fruiting uh, fungal bodies. You're unlikely to find so many, not so many. That doesn't mean there aren't fungi existing. Okay, a uh, quick look. Here's our recyclers look. 
taking out that tree, two different types there on that particular piece of dead wood. And that's what happens. Various types of fungi come in at various stages of the decay uh, because they are specialists at the different parts. Trees are made up of cellulose and lignin, two of the toughest um, um, uh, materials uh, in the natural world. And it's fungi, one of the only things that can break them down, which is why they're essential. And here we have a parasite, uh, the killer. This is the honey fungus. Some of you uh, avid gardeners out there may be familiar with it because it's kind of like the blight for your garden. No, my trees, what's this mushroom in the ground or on the tree? And it's, it's, it's a parasite and it will slowly be killing your tree, the honey fungus. All right, but I'm gonna show you a different uh, parasite. Let, let's come off screen share for a minute. Uh, this one here, this is Cordyceps militaris, that's the Latin, uh, and it's called the Scarlet Caterpillar Club. And they're like little matchsticks. I've mentioned um, that um, snake tongue truffle club. So it's club shaped. This is Cordyceps. And its host, the thing that chooses to parasitize, is fascinating. So at this point, ladies and gentlemen, I shall try and demonstrate with my super mega expensive puppet show. Here it is. Here we go. Let's have a look. Let's see if I can demonstrate for you. I need, I need to still be in shot myself, don't I? Here we go. Am I in? Am I in? Yeah, okay, I can, I can bend like that, can't I? Just get me angles, right? I'm just gonna get me angles. All right. It's not easy in a box bedroom, I'll be honest. Let's hope I do enough of these to afford a big house. Okay, uh, right. Here is our caterpillar. This is the substrate. This is, no, this is the host, okay? So we've got a lovely little caterpillar making its way along the grass. Can you tell sit? You can, you can see that. Making its way along its habitat. Often grassland spaces are fine this, but they can be found in the woods, cemeteries, and even gardens. It's making way it's along. At some point, it gets infected by the spores. Now, to make this model, I tried to do a little bit of research, and I, uh, I reached out to uh, mycologists, and I le reached out to le leptidus. Oh, no. You know what I mean, don't you? Lept I can't get the word out. You know what I mean, don't you? It's the butterfly moth spe specialist people. Leptidarist. I can't get it. I reached out to see if anyone could tell me. Okay. We don't know if it eats the spores in its substrate in the soil or if it, it, it attaches through the skin. Either way, this now becomes infected with the cordyceps fungus. Now, here's the bit that could have a bit of artistic license. You may have seen a version of cordyceps. There are many types um, on uh, one of the natural uh, programs with David Attenborough. And he talks about this incredible one. Some of you would have seen this footage with an ant. And it's called the zombie fungus. And people call this the zombie fungus. I'm about to demonstrate because it takes over the caterpillar's brain. And in, in the case of the one that I'm talking about with David Attenborough, the ant's brain, and it forces that ant to a completely foreign place it would never usually go, which is to the highest point of the canopy of the whole of the Amazon rainforest, whereupon it takes over its jawline, makes it clench down on a leaf, then it consumes its inside, bursts out of its head, and because it's at the very highest point, that's the perfect vantage point to get the optimum uh, release and wind currents to take its spores far and wide. Fantastic, the zombie fungus. So what I don't know is, what we, we don't know yet still, is if this caterpillar is burning itself to pupate or is it being driven down by the fungus? For artistic license, let's say it's burying itself because of this cordyceps. So it's going into the ground, it's burning itself, it buries maybe to pupate, let's be honest, but it's on and down and in the soil and it's infected. At this point now, the fungus will begin to consume its insides. From the, from the back to the front, it will completely consume it. So you've got this mycelial mass and then it's ready to make its fungus fruiting body. So the fungus has found its host, it's eaten away. Now it needs to reproduce like all fungi. So here comes the fungus fruit body. And in this case, it's this incredible orange club that comes up and out of the ground like this, breaks the surface of the grass, bursts out of its head. It could be several fruitings on one caterpillar and out and into the wind like that, whereupon the spores from this granular surface, the spores, the seeds are on the outside surface here, catching the wind and away. Similar with the mushroom, by the way, it's the reason it has a stem is to get up and out of the grass for the same thing, optimum possibility to take those spores away. And if you find one of these and they're only small, if you ever see one, there's a great moment you can do um, a mini, like a, a, a diddy dig, a mini excavation. And, and pull out a small clump of soil. If you carefully break away, you can actually get the fungus fruit body with the, and the caterpillar still attached. It's an amazing thing. There we are, Cordyceps militaris, the Scarlet Caterpillar Club. All right, I'll bring us back around. Um, let's, uh, let's keep going. Let's. Um, did I stop sharing there? Did I do that? Were you able to see? I didn't mean to, I, I do apologize. I don't know if that's bigger for people. 
All right. Um, oh, I've just, I'm sorry, but I've spotted a compliment. The first thing I've seen in the chat is the kids are fortunate to have me as a teacher. That's very kind of you to say so. Thank you. Uh, let's have a look. So I'm going to go back to this. Go back to my little PowerPoint there. And I'll show you what, let's have a look what's next. Because for me, it's quite a surprise as well. Uh, yeah, learn about fungi. Okay. So if we're talking about identification i kind of covered this at the start i just wanted to make sure that everyone was was happy with this notion of uh, holding a fruit body to, to to study it there are certain fungi that you can look at certainly with experience and expertise you can look at and go, i know what that is and we won't need to touch it every foray um where it's a um uh, a recording survey that i do with my local group or the British Mycological Society, there will be fungi fruit bodies picked, as I said, because it's essential to be accurate with this information. We know how important data is uh, for the natural world. And many fungi could look superficially similar, but again, without the correct whole observation of the whole fruit body, we might be misinterpreting and misinforming the information. So it's important to take them up. So getting up and close is dead important. I'll talk a little bit more about what things and features to look for to help you in your identification process, should you be interested, I'll give you a few tips a little bit later on. Now then, first of all, this is a mushroom. Uh, it, this is a fungus. Do you know what I'm going to do? Uh, have I got another one? Okay. Fungus is singular, more than one. Now I've got a bracket, but it's still a fungus. Now I've got fungi. So that's just a quick note. Fungus, fungi. It's just a, a matter of plural. That's all it is. Uh, just a little note for you there. Um, so fruit bodies, as we traditionally know them, mushrooms, also known as toadstools, there's no difference. Those names are interchangeable. For, for my, for all that I've read up, people used to think as toadstool was the poisonous one, mushrooms edible. That is not the case. So it's just an interchangeable word for either one. So we've got mushrooms that typically have gills, these little flaps of tissue that we'll be familiar with from any mushrooms we bought from the supermarket, perhaps. Um, that's a mushroom. But we know there are many other fruiting bodies. All mushrooms are fun. A fungi, I nearly got it wrong myself, didn't I? But not all fungi are mushrooms, because fungi, some fungi can be earth stars. Let's have a look. We've got mushrooms with gills. We've got these pores. We've got beliefs. Also mushroom, just with a spongy surface. But now we've got these other fruiting bodies. And this is what I love. This is what I want to share and why I get so excited. The variety, the smells, the shapes, the colours. It's so intriguing and, and, and visually exciting and sensory exciting. I had a slide at the end for well-being. I don't think we have time for it, but it, there's so much to gain from nature and from fungi, especially, especially I, would, I would say that. I know that there's so much else, but look at that. Find a little earth star. Amazing. That's a fungus fruit body. We've also got uh, brackets. What else have we got? We've got stink horns and puffballs. And we've got morels and cups and clubs and corals. These are all different fruit bodies of fungi. And right now it's peak season. With these rains we had these last few weeks, if you take a walk out, and I'll share some of these places with you now, um, it, the, the, the fungal diversity that's on, on offer for us is just amazing and actually quite overwhelming. I, I, all I do right now is think, eat, dream, sleep and teach fungi. What, what a treat. It's all choice, of course. You know, I choose to do that, so it's not complaint. Uh, OK, uh, let's let's meet a couple and I'll talk about some habitats. So I had one in my hand there. This actually wasn't one that I planned to share with you this evening. But on the way, way home, walking home from the tram station, I thought, oh, well, there's one because there's a whole host of these. There's an absolute bucket load of them growing with a particular tree on a subway embankment. And it's quite a common mushroom that some of you may be familiar with in your gardens if you have them. If you do have these in your gardens, I'm going to put my neck online and say you've got a birch tree very nearby. This and its namesakes, the part underneath here, this bit that's just curved under at the, the margin. We call this the margin of the of the uh, mushroom. This is the brown roll rim. Most likely it's a Paxillus and there's about four or five of them. This is most likely Paxillus involutus. Um, a very common one that can get really big, proper dinner plate size. And look at it. I can't know if you can catch it, but it looks like a big piece of pastry pie. I'll tell you what, let's let's stop sharing because I don't know if you need that there. I don't know if it's different. It looks like a, a big a big pastry lid, um, and it has actually one of the key features is it's a bit hard to pick up here, but as you go around, it actually looks like it's pinched pastry. It's got a pie crust edge. One of the key features. It's got a depression as it gets older, but the main feature is this this rim, and it's velvet like. If you could feel this, if we had not smell a vision, feel a vision. If you could just feel 
you know, how many years away from that under? Uh, it's amazing, lovely velveteen soft edge, a beautiful thing. I'm going to mention, I don't know how much learning to pack in, but obviously I can't help myself. I wasn't planning on telling you this, but the way that gills attach to the stipe, that's the proper name, the stem of a mushroom, can be a big factor in what genus, what family holding in your hand. In this case, these gills you'll see run down the stem, some go in at the side, some are notched and sinuate, some go up and some go right up into the cap and it's completely free of gills. These are decurrent gills. So when I see these mushrooms, and it can be quite variable depending on conditions, decurrent gills, a pie crust edge, depression, shiny brown cap, it's a roaring. Interesting fact, we could all eat them potentially once or twice, maybe even for years, but eventually it will catch up and kill you. This is, becomes a deadly mushroom. And the only known mycologist, professional mycologist to die from uh, mushroom poisoning was from eating this. And I think he had it for something like 30 years or something. But eventually it caught up on him because his immune system attacked him back. Uh, it's an accumulative toxin that never quite leaves your body. Uh, and apparently it doesn't taste actually all that good. So I don't know why he chose that. If he was a mycologist, I think there were better things to pick. Um, okay, that's one, the brown roaring. Uh, what should we go for? I'll go for, I'll tell you what, let's go for exotic. Okay, I showed you one there. And here it is. This is a very young one, little earth star. And these just happen to grow in our school gardens. People often call me lucky and occasionally uh, I get called lucky and it kind of rubs me up a bit. It's like, mm, you don't know the man I was. I put a lot of footwork into my walks and purposeful walks and environments and habitats and often nothing fruitless. But sometimes I do get fortunate, I'd say that in our school gardens, right place, right time, we happen to have earth stars. They're not uncommon, but there's a lot of people wait quite a few years before they first ever see one. This is one before it opens out. It actually starts like an onion and then it splits to reveal this spore sac inside. And actually, there was tons of they were both disconnected. The, the idea is they disconnect eventually to kind of move away. Um, we've got this here. This is where those rays kind of bend right backwards. These rays are the, the star parts. Aren't they absolutely beautiful? And we'll pull our little show, a quick mention of spore dispersal. I talked about the ones on the outside surface of the zombie fungus. The, the gills of a mushroom, that mushroom I had here, the spores right now will be pouring out from these gills in a downwards fashion and catching on the very minor currents in this house. Okay, so these are spore droppers, these mushrooms, basidiomycetes. This one is a spore shooter and it's a mechanized, a mechanized spore dispersal. How clever that when anything like raindrops or twigs or a fox's foot or some bearded man's finger comes and gives it a prod. Watch closely. Where can we get it? There we go. Let's try for there. Are you watching? Did you see that? Yeah, there we are. Poop, poop. There we are. It puffs its spores out. And as I was picking these in the rain this evening, as I went down into the bushes at school, a raindrop hit one, slap bang on, and I saw it happen for real. It was a great moment because I've never seen it happen naturally. It's just always big people's fingers. So the amazing Earth Star. This is the collared Earth Star. We have different types. There's a few and there's some that grow specifically with you and you'll often find me scratching around a yew tree if i see an ancient yew i'm under it just on the off chance i find some of these tiny small earth stars it's not happened yet so that's that footwork i'm on about pulling over great for graveyards suddenly to jump out and look in a yew tree no look yet my day will come um all right so we've looked at that one and i'll mention this one. Oh no i've done two that's enough for now that's enough let's move on Oh, it's 20 to, what, 20 to 8 already? No, no, there's not enough time. Let me share my screen again. Let's whiz through some bits. I was up to here, I think, wasn't I? All right. Let's have a look. So my, when I say meet my mates, I mean the fungi that are with me right now in the room. My, they are my friends. I love to meet them and hang out with them. So you want to find fungi? Okay, you've got to turn your, these are the spaces. Let me share a few spaces where you can expect to find fungi. Number one ultimate prime place to spend your time right now if you want to find fungi would be a woodland better still an ancient woodland because it's very special with ancient woodlands you get ancient relationships habitats within habitats long established relationships more equal diversity from because of the age of some of these trees that are, uh, are established there um, and you can get some beautiful beautiful fungi also unimproved grassland which are like uh, sheep grazed pastures often high up spaces where there has been no industrialization or farmers input of pesticides or fungicides. Uh, and you get some beautiful wax caps, clubs and corals in these spaces. It's just some of my favorite fungi. Um, but to be honest, there is almost a fungus for every environment. Sand dunes, wetlands, the alpines, they're all happening. 
I'm whizzing through this because I want to get to the point. For me, what I want to get really shout about is just how accessible fungi are. You know, the na nature is, isn't it? We all know that. If people, if there's so many naturalists here right now. I'm sure you have a, an invested interest in nature. Just want to get people on board. But look, we don't all live near an ancient woodland. And you don't have to be of a certain demographic or cohort or live in a certain space because you will find fungi if you know where to look. So I'm a massive advocate for urban fungi. Yes, you won't find certain special things that exist only in specific habitats, but there is enough to get you excited about and, and that I get excited about. I've, I've cycled to work for years. I don't anymore. So now it's the walk. But during that cycle, I knew all the spaces, the local fire station where you get these beautiful parasols. You get um, lurid beliefs outside a care home. You know, this is on one of the most popular bus routes in, in Manchester. And I just knew all these little pockets, roadside verges. Oh, stop talking, just show you. Gardens, parks, roadside verges, hedgerows, scratchy little hedgerows, all sorts grows under a hedgerow. Just poke your head in. Trust me, try it tomorrow. Get your head under a hedgerow and see what's there. I'm not, no promises, of course. Uh, leisure centre car parks. Leisure centre. My local leisure centre, I get St George's mushrooms. And this is right in the city, the centre of Bury, where I live. I get um, fairing champignons, brown roll rims, tricholoma, night fungi. It's amazing. And that's just on a leisure centre car park. So knowing where to look. Now, the reason they grow in some of these spaces is the next thing I want to share with you. Let's see if it's there. Oh, yeah, this is the thing. You want to find fungi? Turn that radar on. Turn it up to 11. Yeah, OK. Because the minute you step out the door, and I don't just mean when you go for that walk at the weekend, you know, purposeful walk, right? We're going out, aren't we, lovely, to the woods today or having a big walk just if you're taking the dog for a walk the minute no the minute you close your door and you step outside from wherever you are even if it's a local shop if there's a smallest hint of green space just keep your radar on because there's a good chance you'll find some fungi especially this time of year all right let's have a look there it is oh look i did a little star thing oh fancy uh this is the reason that lots of roadside verges leisure center car parks car parks for things like garden centers they often have birch in we're talking birch beach, pine and oak. Birch, beach, pine and oak. Everybody now, birch, beach, pine and oak. Birch, beach, pine and oak. And if you can get that in your head, that little earworm of oops upside your head, it took me years to realize that that's what the tune was. Um, get those four. They are the four big trees, the four trees that are host to more mycorrhizal fungi, friendship fungi than any of us. Um, and so when I'm out and about tootling about, I see a lovely cluster, a grass embankment, short mown, Beautiful birch. I'm thinking I'm going to have a look over there. And sure enough, you might find milk caps or what have you. Lots of different things. Uh, so there are your four big trees. That's my big tip for finding fungi. Yes, habitat, habitat, habitat. You've got to be in the right spaces. But the trees can make a big difference when it comes to the mycorrhizal fungi. And so for urban ones especially, you know, I think I'm going to mention a space. Here it is. Good, I did mention this. Get down with the gravestones. I keep talking about only one takeaway tip. Here's another one. I want you all to go visit your local graveyard or cemetery if you don't already. And I'm sorry for those circumstances if you're going for different reasons. But now you can go for fungi as well because these spaces are brilliant or can be, I should say, for fungi. Um, there we have a fungus, a wax cap. Now I mentioned the wax caps are, are unimproved pastures. That's their specialism. But actually those mossy spaces are replicated in ancient cemetery spaces because that is an ancient space of grass they call it god's acre and you can get beautiful wax caps clubs corals growing entolomas the pink gills growing these spaces so what i did i meant to get this actually as a visual thing i bought an Auden survey map a few years ago it's just before lockdown and i bought it and i marked off on the map all the space all the local cemeteries within my a few miles radius i thought i'll cycle around all that we'll get i'll do a graveyard tour that's what i'll do and I pinned it up on the wall and it was like something from uh, one of these um, CSI murder investigation things where they have all the string pointing. And you won't believe the things I found. I went round six graveyards and I found what was once considered red data, pink ballerina wax cap. And I found that in four of the six sites. And it got, so obviously that doesn't mean they're not still rare. They're just possibly locally common. I would go as far as saying they are locally common. And I think we've just got a stronghold in the Northwest but I found over 50 fruit bodies in one little lawn here. I couldn't believe my eyes. Cemeteries are amazing. I bobbed in one during my son's football training. I've watched enough of that. Not that I'm not a good dad when I can help it, but football training. I'll just nip and see what was going on in that graveyard. I found incredible things, beautiful corals. I found a rare belete, 
that doesn't come up very much, you know, on, in data. So yeah, these are great spaces. Check out your local cemetery. Um, hey, we're running short of time. So a couple more fungi to share with you. Let's have a look. I'll stop sharing. Um, oh, they, yeah, okay, I'm going into a bag. I'm no longer allowed to use pots in the house in keeping things fresh in the fridge with a lid on. So forgive me for using a plastic bag. Um, there's two reasons. One is one of these things stinks to high heaven and the other, these pots in the fridge. When I'm recycling my dream pots, Mrs. McKernan's going in the fridge and thinking she's getting the low pack and instead she's faced with a, with a disgusting mushroom and she's had enough. So I, I had to quickly slip these in the bag. I didn't dare do the pot thing. Two amazing things. This one is quite something. Do you know what? This, this isn't good TV, is it? I should have had a slide for this. This got handed to me and it's the first time I've ever found it. And it turns out, and I, it was so, I knew so little, it was just at the back of my mind what it was when I was given it. I'm like, wow, let's go, can you go right out to the, don't even know if you can focus. It looks like a shriveled up red piece of fruit. And that's the point. It's designed itself, evolutionary, I presume, to look like a piece of dried up fruit. So birds will eat it, ingest it, fly away, and the seeds pass through the spores and that's their spore dispersal. So you actually find this underneath berry trees. Most often new, it's a New Zealand fungus that's made its way here. It's nowhere else in Europe and it's largely only in Northern England. And there's only 30 records of this. There's probably more found and that's on, only on the BMS's recording site. But nevertheless, and I was handed this, I thought, I know what you are, I think. And it's like a truffle, the New Zealand false truffle, this red little pouch. So that was cool. That was handed to me at the weekend when I was leading a foray in a local park. And I'm like, I can't believe this exists. And the other one, I took some colleagues out Monday night to the local. This is worse still. Forgive me. I'm just going to have to make it sound interesting. This is something special. I've only found this once before. And when I did, I had to ring uh, uh, my mentor. I was live in the late just to say, dude, what is this thing? I'll send you a picture. It's driving me crazy. He said, Ali, bend down and smell it. And when you smell this, it's like putrid garlic, a bit like bin juice or that bad potato that goes bad in the bag. You know, the black when they go all juicy and start rotting. It's the stinking earth fan and not a common find. And it was in abundance. Again, why I took one, there was absolutely swathes of chunks of it in the moss. Just again at a local park, Heaton Park, if anyone happens to be in the, the Bury, Manchester area. And what a find. I've been going to Heaton Park for years and never spotted that. So the stinking earth fan. Smell your mushrooms. That must come up. Let, let's get to um, let's get to finish this, this presentation off, or I'm going to be uh, running over by a million miles. Three tips. Listen, let me give you some tips for identifying fungi. Let's try. I'll try. Hands on. And by that, I mean you need to see the whole fruit body. You are welcome to leave. Listen, if, if there's just one of something there, if we're talking about, you know, con conservation and being, and being and treading lightly, there's just one of something. You don't know what that is. Try and take as many photos as you can in situ. If there's a whole abundance, it might be worth taking one with you and then looking at books and then you're able to in your home and online or asking people online what it is that you might have had. But just what I'm saying is just a picture of its cap from above, like the top of your head. It's just no use. You need to see more. So look at the whole fruit body. Um, smell it. Smells massive. Engine oil, coconut milk, fenugreek, curry. There's some other ones. Many, many, many. Watermelon. There's tons and tons of smells. So give that fungus a smell. And in fact, I think that needs to go back in the bag. It's putting me off. The uh, ugh. But great. Fascinating. A good reason to smell horrible. Um, so, yeah, the whole fungus itself, you need to see if there's a ring. You need to see the shape of the base. Has it got a bulb at the bottom? Has it got a root? Is it coming out of a bag? The shape and the angle of your stipe can mean everything. The, the way the gills are attached, as I mentioned, features on the cap. There is so much to devour and look at, and it's the little nuances. Two mushrooms can look almost identical. Beautiful edible, deadly poisonous. And it's this slight overlap, just some one little feature that's different that can tell you what you've got in your hand. And like, ah, I know what you are now because of, because of the smell. They look the same, but you smell of that thing. So, yeah, get up close and personal with these fungi. The big trees, when you find a mushroom in the woods, in the grass, look up, acknowledge what trees are nearby. If it's one of the big four, it could be a mycorrhizal fungus. Some are just grassland species, but it can really help the identification. Some fungi only grow with birch. The orange birch bleach, if I see it, it has to be a birch tree nearby. Even if it was a sapling, it's impossible for the orange birch bleach to grow otherwise. And there are milk caps and rushlers of the same ilk. Um, have a look what it's growing on, is it? Feathers, leaves, twigs, dead wood, standing dead wood. Is it uh, the roots of the tree? All these uh, tips for looking at what the substrate is 
can be crucial to what that fungus is because fungi, uh, very many of them are habitat specific. All right. Oh, a bonus tip. Take good photos. Yeah. I about mentioned that already, actually, is the first part. OK, um, I think we're getting close to a finishing time of a mushroom here that you many of you will be familiar with. This is the fly agaric. And I'm just going to explain how he gets his spots so the next time you're walking out in the woods, they are out at the moment. It's a good time to see them. And they're quite a common fungus and they love, look where it is. There you go. There's an example. I was just about to say they love birch. There's a birch tree right behind. Um, by the way, if you're not mad on trees and you find it a bit daunting, I didn't know any when I started my journey of fungi. And because I read so much, you need to know them. I just started to learn them. And I'm only asking you to learn four big ones. Birch, beech, pine and oak. Pine, I'm being a bit loose, really. It's all conifer, but pine are a good one. All right. You have to picture this is a baby fly agaric. I'm going to show you how it gets its spots. OK, imagine this is the baby mushroom in its in its young state. And it's what it is, is it's enclosed. It's encapsulated in like a, a soft shell, like an egg. OK, uh, and it's known as when it when it breaks out of this egg and the mushroom comes out, the bottom half stays behind sometimes for some fungi, the amanitas, the deadly poisonous, many of which are poisonous, toxic. Um, the bottom half can stay behind and that's called a vulva on the death caps, for instance, there's this bag at the base. And the top part can split away, and that's called the universal veil. So what do fungi need? If this is a baby one, they need a little bit of rain, don't they? I think it does say rain on it. This is rain. And then we're going to cover it. This is our young one. This is how it starts out with its universal veil. All right. So we've got the universal veil on there. And this is it. This is our universal veil. So this young mushroom is sitting inside this en en encased in here. As the mushroom grows up and out and that cap, the top expands, it leaves behind veil remnants. So hopefully this demonstrates what I mean. Big moment this, here we go, let's give it a try. Ta-da! It's funny. I can't, I, I would love to think that you're all making an audible noise like, ooh, or, wow, or even clapping, you know, in crazy fashion, but it's an absolute deathly silence because you're all muted. So I'll just have to picture that moment. But yeah, there it is. Ah, it's impressive that, isn't it? It's not my trick. I've tried to track down the person who invented this and we can't find them. Uh, but yeah, um, that's how the mushroom gets its spots. The cat breaks open and it leaves behind remnants, um, which is a pretty cool way of, of demonstrating that, I do think, if I'm honest. Okay, uh, that really is the finishing point. I suppose that's a bit like the fireworks at the end of a, a, a gig. A bit of tissue on a balloon. Is it, the, is, it, is it the equivalent? I don't know. Let's finish with this. Some guidebooks. People often ask me what if I recommend a good guidebook. These are three good ones. The first one, most importantly, is, is this, as you can see. Uh, this is like Bible-sized, and it is like a Bible for me in the woods. Not so much these days, because I'm, I'm quite familiar with the contents, but it's a good one for taking out in the field. If we're talking about having something with you when you find a mushroom, this is good. It's got lovely pictures, accessible information. It's in, there's, the common names are there, and not just the Latin, and it's not too scientific, so it's, it's, it's accessible information is what I'd say, and it's great. And this is my second copy. I've got this full of notes looking everything. And this is my second copy because the other one, wherever it is, is at like the base of a pine tree in Lytham somewhere when I was on a foray and left it behind. Um, Roger Phillips mushrooms, that white one. As you advance and maybe when you come home, it's a bit big for carrying around. So as you get into this, if you do, you start cross-referencing like, oh, it looks a bit different in this. You will need several pictures, different stages of growth. And Roger has more pictures. Essentially, you can't have a book with every picture of every angle of every mushroom because it'd be like this. You know, it'd just be like carrying the ark or something. So you need to cross-reference. And that one, last one, uh, Mushroom Miscellany, is just a lovely book for a general read of all things fungi. Uh, I think, oh, um, websites, First Nature, Mushroom Spotters on all the BMS on Facebook. They're very friendly sites who will help you with your ID. Try your best first, always, you know, but then just say, please, I really need some help with this. Could anyone tell me what this might be? And people are really accommodating their lovely spaces on Facebook. I think I need to stop and I need to now be asked questions. Um, I hope something came out of that. Um, and listen, uh, what's this going to be? What do you call it? A disclaimer. I am not brilliant. If you're going to deep dive me now, I might not have the answer. I just like the funny names and things. But I'll try my best to answer your questions. But if it's a deep dive on ecology, for instance, that's not my skill set. It's not my my best bit, but I will give it a try. Okay, so uh, let's do I stop the share now and try and answer. Let's have a look. Okay, let's try and answer some questions. How do I do this, ladies of, of the trusts? <laughs> we the have chat? got one question. Um, Mark, do you want to come on to um, microphone or I can ask it for you? 
release yourself, Mark. Be brave. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, my, my question was, um, what can I do as somebody who enjoys uh, mushrooms, finding fungi, um, to encourage the growth of a variety of fungi, aside from just not picking rare mm -hmm. fungi? Do you mean it on, a, on a personal level? You mean, if you mean in your homes, then it's create a, a log pile, is what I'd say. So if you've got a garden or even a yard, because I don't have a garden, I have a yard and I have a yard, but I've created log piles of different ages and different types of wood just to encourage those spaces for those wood rotters, those recyclers. Um, and the rest, I would leave it to do its thing because, you know, it's in control, obviously, damage limitation and whatnot. Uh, but tread lightly. But if you want to encourage encouraging fungi is pretty tricky. Well, here's something. Look, I've got a giant puffball here. So if I was going to show you to encourage a giant puffball sporulation and the spreading of it, I could watch this. You ready? Look at all those. They are thousands upon thousands of spores. So you could boot if you find a giant puffball tumbling around doing its job of being very, very light. It's like polystyrene tumbling around, give it a boot. And you're helping all these spores get out into the air. That's my take on it. Because ultimately, we want those spores to get out and about. So if you're out and about and see a giant puffball, you can do that. Otherwise, I'd say the fungi have got it covered with their various means. But you can encourage it. Your active way would be to create uh, habitats within your home uh, in, 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 a, in an area close to you by creating those log piles from wood. Uh, you know, you could salvage some of, or if it's created for whatever reason. I hope that helps a little. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. We've got a, quite a few people asking in, in the chat if um, you can still touch mushrooms that are poisonous to eat. Um, quite a lot of people asking that question. Uh -huh, it's a really good question. What a great question. OK, so are you ready? You can it is safe to touch any mushroom in the world, even the most poisonous. OK, I've got to be careful there when I say that out loud because of because if you touch a death cap, for instance, the, one of the most poisonous you know, there is a risk that you, you may ingest a little bit of material. And that's the point. It's ingesting the material that's the dangerous part. You can't get poisoned just from it uh, seeping into your hands. If you were to hold a death cap, potentially, for hours and hours, it may be able to track into your system. The smallest piece like this is enough to kill 30,000 mice. So it, it is a highly toxic mushroom. But if, if I probably shouldn't be saying this out loud. But I, I felt the first day I found death caps, I was over the moon. It can take years. They're not a common mushroom. And I found one. And our kids were camping with fam family camp. And I just found them went crazy and I handled them and made a video and everything. And I went back and made a barbecue for everyone. Never even thought about washing my hands. So I'll be really honest about that. And I, we're all still here. Um, so, yeah. And, and yeah, it is safe to touch all fungi. If anything, you're more likely to get any poisoning if it's really degraded because we've got a lot of nasty bacteria then and anyway just general bacteria on fungi so we've certainly with children we're going to watch fingers in mouths but it's the actual ingestion of any tissue that's the poisoning part not just the the light touching of fungi will be fine there's one fungus i'm going to mention that a mycologist a friend of mine told me and i uh, look up to him greatly and it's got he said there's only one fungus i'd wear a pair of gloves for and it's something called the horned stalk ball do you know what? I downloaded the picture to put it into the presentation at one point for the weird and wonderful. I realised I won't have enough time for everything. I found this and its job is to rot down sheep's horns. Now I've watched this, I've seen this photo in a book for years and years and years, thinking, wonder if that day will ever come. And that day came and I knew what I found immediately. These tiny little stalked mushrooms growing out, like hard, solid little mushrooms growing out of this dead sheep's horn that I found up in the hills. And I was obviously over the moon and I handled it and looked at it. And only afterwards, he said, I would never touch that because, without gloves, the keratin. Its job is to dissolve the keratin. And he says, and we have keratin in our fingernails, don't we? I didn't know that at the time. And I handled that as well. And again, here I am with no stock balls. Um, and I feel like, personally, I think we'd see pictures online of humans' nails with stock balls on. And I've never seen a one. So I, I'm not so convinced. But there you go. If there was one, it's that. But do take just gentle touching. You're absolutely fine. There you go. Should we have another one? Uh, yeah, someone mentioned, um, what about poison fire coral? What about it? Do you know, what what, is, this, is, this, is this a bluff? Can you handle that? Can is this, is this my that? mother trying to catch me out? Is this my mum doing my head and trying to catch me out? I'm, I'm sorry, I've never heard it. I'm writing this down because I'm here to learn as well. Poison fire, poison fire fungus? Poison fire coral. I don't know if Muddy Woody Mama wants to come on to um, 
There might One be muddy woody mama. I'm not saying it doesn't exist. There's, uh, I, there is so many fungi I've never met and never heard of. I just haven't heard of that. So what, what, what's this one? Please tell us. If, if you're happy to. Or is it my mum then? Is it my mum just trying to call, call, call the bluff on me? I'm going to write it down. And maybe someone will be Googling while we're on it for another few minutes yet. And maybe the answer will come up. Poison fire coral. I can't imagine. Maybe this is a, 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 a species from abroad, but I'm not, I've never come across that name. And again, that doesn't mean it's, it doesn't exist in this country. I know a few corals. I know a few that look like fire. I've never heard of one known as the poison one. I might be about to learn something. Please tell me more. I'd love to. I'd love to hear about that. Uh, um, we've got Jess with her hand up. If you want to ask a question, Jess. Go for it, Jess. Oh, he's actually Jess's partner. Uh, <laughs> um, I, I've, I've put the question in, into the chat. It was just we were curious to know what your top three favourite edibles are. Okay, um, top three favourite edibles. Edibility is a big thing for me. Just, just, just to put it out there, and I'll tell you only. I'll tell you why, and I'm, I'm totally understanding people that do eat um, fungi. It's just, it, it, it isn't my agenda because uh, generally I try to tread lightly. That's a personal take on things. Um, but also because if, if I'm going out for edibles as a starting point and I want to find something that I know the right season, I go to a particular habitat and I don't find that. If I come home without it, I guess I'll be disappointed. And I don't believe we should ever be disappointed from a walk in the outdoors, a walk outside in nature. So I've learned to lower my expectations. Just go out. I don't look for any particular fungi hardly ever anymore. I used to want to find a certain one. But it, it, disappointment is ridiculous, isn't it? We should never be disappointed for a walk in the woods. So I lower my expectations and I'm happy. I just love finding all different types of fungi. That's my thing. That said, I do eat them occasionally, but not, not so often. Um, but I once did a taste off in the early days of 10 different fungi after I'd been on a foray with a professional who, who was teaching me at the time, a mentor. And number one, are you ready? Porcini. That was right up at the top. Number two is the Prince, an incredible one that, that smells of almonds. It smells like um, Battenberg. That's it, frangipan, amazing, the prince. And number three, actually, for me, and people will be mad about this, there's hen of the woods, there's a bunch. It's a bit like doing your desert island discs. It's hard, isn't it? But I'd also say um, the blusher. It's not a beginner's fungus because it has a poisonous lookalike, a very, very poisonous toxic lookalike, the panther cap. But the blusher I found to be delicious at the time. I've not eaten them for years and I find millions of them, but I just don't ever get round to eating them or choose to. So there you go, top three. I think that was it, porcini. Something else. Oh, Prince and Blusher. There you go. Next one. Thank you. Um, Sheila said, when a new woodland is planted, how long does it take for fungi to establish? Mm, that's a really good question. I don't necessarily have the answer to that, I'm afraid. Um, but I do know of someone that says, someone's monitoring a wood that's only 20 years and there are some really well-established, lovely mycorrhizal fruiting bodies. I suppose it could depend if the trees that are planted, the saplings, are inoculated with mycorrhiza already, because we know tests have shown that that can boost the aid of the growing of the tree incredibly. NASA did an experiment with two birch trees. One was in sterile soil and one was inoculated with fungi. And the, there were two birch and that one grew 10 times bigger. Now, of course, that's actually sterile, so that wouldn't be fair to, it's not rep, a true representation of soil, but it just shows what fungi can do uh, for the health well it's essential to the health and the well and the growth of, of a tree so it depends if they're inoculated um it depends how soon that first dead wood comes down because the dead wood then obviously creates fungus i would say the fungi are there pretty early on because as soon as the leaf litter starts in my mind you know you're creating a detritus you're creating an organic substance that needs rotting um yeah and even young birch trees even there's one a classic one a woolly milk cap that grows traditionally with young birch trees. So these new, um, what they call these like um, uh, uh, estates, uh, business estates, you know, where you walk in and it's a big winding water, you drive in and, and these little grass verges planted with new pines, uh, new birch, often find stuff under there. So that, and they're only a matter of five, 10 years old. So not very long before the fungi take is what I'd say. And it would of course depend on which fungi because some might take years to establish. There you go. Um, a lot of people asking if you can recommend a good app um, for identification. Um, Ray mentioned that she found some fungi in, a, in an ancient graveyard and she just couldn't tell the difference between saffron milk caps or false 
ones mm. um so is there a good app that you could recommend oh do you know what i'm sorry i'm I, I, what a shame i haven't got this information oh yes i think it's called seek is it called seek listen um in the fungal world people can turn the nose up a bit you know I, I, i'm I'm around a lot of fungi people and fungi lovers and the bottom line is there is nothing can replicate a human being because even human beings can't get it right and I say even you know this is not calculation this is not numbers this is nuances and so a, an app just cannot pin down and we it was a great moment when I went out with the colleagues on Monday one of the girls was using I think it might have been Seek or iNaturalist I don't know if that actually does the identification at the time she was recording for the school and uh she, she was laughing because she'd cheer every time it got it right, even though she was set, stood next to like this guy who knows quite a lot. I'd say, yeah, that's a such thing. And I'd explain and she'd go, hey, you're right. And show me the app, like really pleased. But every time I said, right, we're going to have to have a little competition, me and this app. And every time she did it, it didn't know what it was. It just put common guild mushroom. And I thought, yeah, what a cop out, common guild. But that's not even common, that one. Um, I, what I would say, because I don't want to turn my nose, but anything that can help with learning, if it aids learning, brilliant. And so, yes, although the apps probably have a long way to go, it, it's almost a, an impossible task to some extent because it will need microscopy. So in field skills, in, in those superficial, large uh, macro skills, they will get there and they are improving all the time. I think that app is called Seek. If someone Googled it and found out, I was able to say yes or no. If anyone's got it, I'm pretty sure I was very impressed by what it could tell. And even if what I don't need to do is think that's it. I don't need to the app tell you and then you go, all right, well, it must be then. Often we'll need second opinions. I still need second opinions all the time on certain fungi that are new to me and I'm not sure about, or even that are old. It's just that they look a bit different. You know, the variability of fungi is one of the mind bending bits. Don't take it for absolute granted. But if it puts you in a certain, uh, pushes along a certain route is what I'd say. And then of course, if you're doing homework with it and not just using the app, that's what I'd say, isn't it? You know, I try and find a bit of time to get the book, look it up on the internet or whatever it says, research it alongside, even if it's a quick Google. Ah, yeah, this is matching. And, and you get a big picture, you think, right, I'm in the right ball zone at least um, to know if you're right. So I'm not saying they're mega reliable, but they're certainly great. They can be a good learning tool. The, yeah, that is an answer to the question you asked, what's a good one? I don't know. I think it's Seek. <laughs> okay. There's a few people saying that Seek is good and also uh, Shroomify as well. Okay. Um, and then some comments just saying that the poison fire coral, if you if you're still interested, yeah, of course I'm still. I've been, I've been is challenged. From, <laughs> is um, from Australia and um, Asia, and actually just touching it can cause cardiac arrest. What is what, what people are saying? <laughs> oh wow! Yeah, there's lots of comments about that in the chat. So, so hey, listen then. So maybe I should have done a disclaimer and said when that question was asked, it should have been. In England or in the UK, so I do apologise. Hey, yeah, that's that's another ball game altogether. There are so many fungi. There are over 16,000 macro species just in this country alone. They're estimated to be millions of fungi, of which we've only discovered ninety percent, ten percent of them. We think ninety percent of fungi are undiscovered yet, which is ridiculous because it's such an under under tapped resource. We don't have one single paid professional mycologist in this country. So we are just, we're just fighting this battle to, and it's great because people are caring, you know, great result that this was well attended tonight. People are seeming to care about fungi. It's what we do next. Uh, but my point being, there are so many fungi, uh, enough to, 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 that I won't find them all in my lifetime by a million miles that I'm just on the UK ones. So I don't know much about exotic or different ones. I do apologize. So actually you were right. There is one you shouldn't touch, but it's in a different country. Um, is using spore prints an accurate way to ID mushrooms if you're not sure what you're looking at? It's one of the elements. It's a great point. And I know I was with some mycologists the other week and they were, they were at it. They had them all laid out. They, for those who don't know how to make a spore print, you can just cut the stipe off and, and drop that cap onto a piece of dark and light paper. So black and white's good. Glass or clear plastic's even better because you get a truer colour. Um, a couple of drops of water and maybe put a Tupperware or a cup or a mug over the top. And that just stops the very slight air currents in your house. Leave it overnight. In the morning, you'll often have a spore print. It's not the clincher, but it could be if you've pieced together. Let's say there's five pieces. Cap looks like this, and it could be one of three families. Stem looks a bit like this. The smell, nondescript, but I think it's a bit farinaceous, blah, blah. But if it's a pink spore print, definitely got it. If it's white, it's going to be this other thing. So it's a piece of the puzzle. It's not an absolute definite, but it's a piece of the puzzle to certainly get to you to a family. 
there are many brown spored mushrooms, tons of them, lots of families with brown spores. But if you think you've got all the things that make a web cap and that brown spore will tell you, yes, then it is, because it's not the other one, which would be pink, there's your clincher. So it's one piece of this beautiful, and I say beautiful because this is the exciting bit, piece it together the little bit. So yeah, spores can definitely make a difference. I just realized tonight that this one that I picked, this brown roll rim, um, it was sat above another one. And when I picked it, the one underneath had this incredible, beautiful brown, brown spore print there. Um, and you will get natural spore prints. So if you see clustered mushrooms, mushrooms clustering, sometimes you can push them back and the spore print will be, reveal itself for you. Um, yeah. Uh, so yeah, spores can be very important to get into genus. I don't rely on it too heavily, but I think that's just the point I'm at further down the line. Um, not that I've not still got laws to learn, I really have. Um, but yeah, um, I'm also the gill color can be the color that the spores have turned those gills that color. That can be a bit of a clue sometimes. Okay, next one. Do you do any courses in Sheffield? <laughs> there you go. That's the that's the last one that's just popped up. I did that one that you came to, didn't I, Rebecca? Yeah, you did. Um, <laughs> so listen, uh, <laughs> the answer is yes. And I'll be doing more next year because I think they were quite pleased. It was the first time I'd run one there. Um, and I think we did like to do more and I'd like to because it's a beautiful space. It was the Longshore Estate. Um, but at the end of the day, I could do I could do tons, but that would make me a really, really bad dad and husband and friend and all the <laughs> brother and all those things that I'm not doing very well at the moment because I'm out every weekend teaching. And of course, I'm enjoying myself. But there, there is ultimately we all need a balance don't we so the point is I actually don't go very far afield because it's more detrimental to other things that I have going on in my life so I'm quite local northwest but I do go as far as Sheffield sometimes I suppose is the maybe answer. next time you can come and do a course or a walk for us <laughs> yes I will I'm, well I'm sure it's <laughs> on the cards um yeah so yeah, yeah I'm happy to come to Sheffield again and it's quite possible so yeah I'd love to do that no problem there we go um does anyone else have any questions that they a lot of people are asking this where did you get your hoodie from? Or is this top secret information? Oh, I can't tell you that. I, tell you that. <laughs> I knew it. <laughs> uh, do you know what? This was a gift, and I think it was from, I think it's, I'm going to say a dubious website, but I might as well tell you because it was a gift. I do like it, so I'm going to wear it. What's it called? Uh, it's a funny place that sells the weirdest things online. You'll have seen it popping up online. It's not, it's not AliExpress. It's one of those other ones um let's have a look it's, yeah you can get you can get beautiful uh, stuff on etsy and, and the likes um and red bubble they have a lot of artists who do their own independent mushroom tops not firebox keep throwing those names up it'll come up what's it called and it, it, people say they sell the oddest things and it's a bit too cheap something doesn't sound right you know no it's not coming i can't see the name we, we'll have to send it out at some point um wish there it is wish I think that's where it came from because I asked where it had come from. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a wish hoodie. Do you know what I realised I should have done? I should try and see if I can find every species and each each time I find it pointed out when it's on here. There are some American ones on here, but there's quite a few English ones too. Um, ben is asking which two trees don't support mushroom fruit bodies, ash and sycamore. And in my very first season, after my first ever foray, learning from a, a paid course that I went on, I went stomping off not realising that and found nothing was really disheartened. I'd got a basket and I'd even got myself a big long staff because I'd read in a book that you can move leaves and ferns to the side looking for mushrooms and I found nothing. I was so despondent. It's because I was stomping around ash and sycamore. So knowledge is power, isn't it? Um, anything else? I don't mind if you'll mute yourself and have a shout out. Oh, someone's got the hand up. Sophia, is that from ages ago? Or... <laughs> <laughs> no, it's just put our hand up now. We picked a lot of mushrooms yesterday Um just in a little woods near us and um, some with like a spongy gills yep they, i think these actually from a few days ago because they've gone all a bit wrinkly but yeah when you make them up they've got loads of bugs in is that quite normal for the mushrooms to have that did you say bugs like b-u-g-s yeah, yeah. Sophia said they're like little parasites or something. Yeah, you get one specific to Belites. Listen, they, they, some fungi I pick, and I'm like, oh, it's that insect again in the same particular family. It's not a surprise, is it? In no. these microscopic worlds that exist within nature, that it's a habitat or a, a food source for something. And Belites are classic for it. The most fa one of the most famous ones, the porcini, the penny bun, um, that you can buy dried in, in Tesco, for instance, that I said is my favourite edible. Um that is often got maggots in it. 
when you cut it open or slice it lengthways or the base, you'll see these little holes, tiny little pock marks, because it's got a particular fly that lives in, uh, that, that lays its eggs in the pores and in the insides of that, and the maggots come out. Um, and so you've got to beat porch, you've got to beat the flies to the porcini. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's not uncommon to find bugs in mushrooms. I've got brackets. Apparently, in theory, depends which bracket. I think I've never got to talk about this. The ten, the hoof fungus, the tinder bracket. Um, but I've got one at school and I've had it for about three years and then I've just looked at it the other week and it's just disintegrating. And when I lifted it, tiny little insects that must have survived. Some of them can survive in brackets even when you've frozen them uh, and then they'll, they'll, they'll still hatch out. Um, so there's probably minute insects in there that may eventually just completely dissolve this to pieces. I'll let you know if I come back next year if it's still still going. Yes, it is a, is a, a host and a space and a home for many insects, many fungi. Want of gills, or is it mainly just this fungus? Because we opened a few of the gills and we can't find anything in them ones. Uh, no, more often the beletes actually, um, but some gilled fungi will have maggots and flies in as well. Yeah, right. St. George's mushrooms can have them. Oh, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Anybody else? Right. Do you know what I could do? I could share. Oh, you're on silent, Rebecca. You'd think I would have learned by now. <laughs> do you want me to? I could, I, is this the end? Are we saying bye then? Are we, go, are we going? What did you want to do? Well, I've got I've got something here that not many people have seen yet. Did you see that? You a lot of you knew that the the octopus stinkhorns are a real thing, uh, a, a real mushroom, and I'd never found it. However, and it, and it bursts out of this egg, these incredible devil's fingers. However, I've got to share this with you. Uh, I have actually managed to secure an egg and it's here, if you can see there. You see the egg there. And it's amazing, I'm over the moon to have finally got one. And obviously at any point that, that, that stink on might actually come, oh, oh my goodness, look at that. I'm really pleased with that. Really, thank you, I got a round of applause there, thanks. There's my little devil stink horn. And I got to use it for the first time last week uh, with the kids at school. I get to teach UK Fungus Day um for for two days solid at my school i've got a wonderful principal who, who, who supports the work that i do and i've not used it yet and i've done it with a couple of adults and it's like oh nice very good and the kids screamed they were absolutely petrified so job done job done uh, i was chuffed to bits okay I, th I think i think that's it from me uh thank you yes. all for your lovely questions and for not asking too hard a question and making me look foolish thank you for that it's been lovely to be here a lot of compliments and great feedback coming in on the chat now as well, just saying how inspiring, how amazing. People saying that they're hooked. It's been great, amazing work. I can't read them fast enough. They're coming up so much. So I could listen to you all day. Wonderful That's really talk. nice. Learned loads. That's really, really so, kind of you all. Thank you. I will mention something because I've got a couple of my own talks left there booked up. I'm not here to advertise. I'm not interested in that. Um, but I am at the RHS Bridgewater which is a Salford thing. I know there's a distance involved, but just in case anyone's in the Northwest. And I think I'm, I'm giving free talks for kids. They're only very short little 40 minute walks or something like that. Uh, four of them through the day uh, on the last Saturday of, of, of in, in next week, next Saturday, not this Saturday, next Saturday. If anyone happens to be at RHS Bridgewater, because that's the way you can get to meet me or, or I can show you fungi and kids if you've got them or grandkids, whatever. I'll be there doing that. And the talks are free, I think, once you've paid to enter the place. Okay, just letting you know that. That sounds brilliant. Thank you. And thank you everyone for coming in this evening. And it's been a fantastic evening. And I'm sure we've all got some impressive new facts and stories to tell our friends and colleagues at work tomorrow. And just a big thank you as well to all our members and supporters, um, many of, who, of you that are here this evening, that let us as a trust manage 15 nature reserves across Sheffield and Rotherham. Um, so just thank you so much. And if you're not already a member, then please do visit our web website and find out more about the kind of thing we do. And also um, for any new members this month, we are offering a free pocket size fungi guide with every new membership. Yeah. So perfect for taking on those awesome walks with you. And uh, lastly, just thank you so much to Ali for joining us this evening. It has been brilliant. Thank you so much. And You're very welcome. Yeah, very welcome. maybe thank we'll you see guys. you soon for part two. <laughs> Lovely. Um, 
I, I will make, I did, I didn't leave a slide with, with, if you wanted to, because I'm, I'm on YouTube. I do silly videos on YouTube. If you look up the fungi guy, shall I just see if it's one of my slides? I think that might be it. Let's have a look. Uh, just, and, oh, I've not mentioned it. Have a look. Is that, has that got the names on? Oh, it's not there. Look, the fungi guy, if you go on YouTube, it's not for everyone, silly videos and Instagram. If you want to follow me there, um, the dot fungi dot guy. If, if, if you want, there you go. And, and you can send me the odd picture. I don't mind. I will. It's a busy time. So if I don't get back straight away, I do apologize. I'm aware that I might now get a hundred more over the next few days, but it, I'll try and ID you photos for you if I can. So be, feel free to get in touch sometime. Okay. That's great. Follow up email as well. Um, so don't worry if you haven't caught something, you can go back and rewatch and I'll send the links to Ali's um, Instagram account as well. So, yes, thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. Thanks, everybody. Goodbye. Have a great evening. Bye bye. Yeah, you too. I feel like it should be, yeah. Uh, should be that, shouldn't it? Bye. <laughs> bye, everyone. Bye. See On you. that note, goodbye, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Are we staying?